Alright, so this is the RetroTINK 2X Mini. As you guys know, I recently picked this thing up, and we are going to take a look at it now. This is a very simple line doubler. This takes 240p input, doubles it up to 480p output. As mentioned, the reason that you want to do that is because a lot of televisions will not handle 240p through the HDMI port. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of scalers don't handle 240p properly. A lot of cheap scalers will treat 240p as 480i, and then they have to deinterlace it. And the deinterlacing, as mentioned, as we saw with the Hyperkin cable, can add some video artifacts um, and also some latency. You've got composite and S video stereo AV inputs and a full size HDMI output on the back. Uh, it's powered by a micro USB power uh, jack and on the side we have a switch. This switch is for toggling the comb filter and by default it's in the what they call the retro position. Personally I didn't find any difference really between the two positions so I think I'm just going to leave it in the retro position most of the time unless for some reason uh, a device dictates otherwise. On the back we have a button this is just to simply toggle the uh, optional uh, smoothing filter. So the smoothing filter, um, you know, personally, I'm not going to use most of the time, especially with 2D, you know, NES, SNES, Sega Genesis. Uh, but with uh, the N64, I can see why people might like it. So I've, I've tested that with the N64. And um, I think it probably does look a little bit better in some N64 games. So at 60 frames per second, one frame is on your screen for about 16 milliseconds. Anything less than 16 milliseconds, we can say it's less than one frame. Well, at that point, it's basically inconceivable. This is literally a few milliseconds. So it's virtually real time. It's as fast as really any scaler can be. Uh, and uh, as far as this goes, there's going to be absolutely zero lag. Now keep in mind, your television itself may have some lag. Your television may have some input lag. It's good to know that though, going through here, you're not adding any lag to that. So, you know, imagine worst case scenario if your scaler has, you know, 60 or 80 milliseconds of uh, lag going through it, and then your television on top of that, you know, has another 60 or 80 milliseconds of lag. You know, you could have 160 milliseconds of lag, and at that point, it's gonna be very noticeable. Some televisions are better than others. You know, some televisions are down to, you know, 15 or 20 milliseconds of input lag. And so if you had something like this on a television like that, you're down to, again, pretty much real time. You know, no conceivable lag at that point. So we're going to compare this almost directly with the Hyperkin 3-in-1 cable that I've shown. This is a uh, Super Nintendo N64 GameCube uh, to HDMI. This is a scaler. This upscales to 720p. And it does, does have some lag. It doesn't handle 240p properly. It treats it like 480i. Again, it has to deinterlace it. And then it's going to upscale that uh, 480p. Uh, to 720p. Um, so that's all happening in here. There's going to be some lag. The other thing that I really like about this over something like this is just the versatility. This has got standard composite AV inputs and S video. If you want to plug an NES into this, if you want to plug a composite modded Atari, maybe you've got a 3DO with S video or a modded uh, Sega Genesis with S video. There's a lot of options here. It's not, you know, restricted to the uh, Super Nintendo style um, port here. And the other really issue with something like this is, you know, what if you break that HDMI connector? You know, if you break that HDMI connector or the HDMI uh, cord, you know, maybe you get a broken wire inside on the HDMI side, or maybe you get a broken wire uh, inside on the uh, Super Nintendo connector side. You know, if this, if one of these wires goes bad or you break the HDMI connector, I mean, this whole thing's done. 
If you break a cable, you break a cable and you replace the cable, but you don't replace the whole scaler. <laughs> you don't replace all the electronics. And that's really what you're paying for. You're paying for the electronics inside. We're also going to compare the RetroTINK to something like this. This is a ve very generic off-the-shelf, under $20 uh, composite to HDMI converter. This one upscales to 1080p. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's going to look any better. And that's one thing to keep in mind. The Hyperkin upscales to 720p. This thing upscales to 1080p. And meanwhile, this guy's only putting out 480p. So if you're just looking at specs on paper and you don't know any better, you might assume that these are going to look better. All right, before we tested this thing, I wanted to take a quick look inside. <laughs> really no reason why. At a curiosity, I guess, it's... Not like I'm going to recognize any of these chips, but I wanted to just see what was inside uh, out of curiosity. Maybe some of you do recognize these uh, chips. As we can see, uh, RetroTINK 2X Mini is silk screened on that motherboard. And it says Mike Chi 2020 version 1.2. And Mike Chi, of course, uh, is the creator of the RetroTINK. Uh, he basically does uh, everything on this, from the design to getting them manufactured. Um, this is a labor of love, as you would say. And that shows, again, latency or lag or lack thereof was definitely a high priority uh, on the RetroTINK. Certainly everything, you know, the quality of the PCB and the soldering and everything looks really good on the bottom side you can see where the um, you know the S video port soldered there for example it looks very solid um, there's another little chip down there in the bottom I think that's it on the bottom as far as any uh, electronics go, it's all on the top side of the board. But again, looks like a quality, quality board. So for Super Nintendo, right off the bat, we've got the Hyperkin 3-in-1 on the left and the RetroTINK on the right. And I wasn't expecting such a difference in color. <laughs> you don't notice that until you see them side by side, you know? Uh, and I don't know, to me, I think the retro tink looks better just right off the bat looking at the color, but we're going to zoom in on some movement here and you're going to see that sort of temporal sharpening that I called it on the Hyperkin uh, in its review in the little triangle, just moving the select, you know, little triangle in the menu there you can see that there's something weird going on with some sort of smoothing or sharpening. I should say sharpening. It takes a second when that thing moves for the sharpening to catch up. Uh, and uh, we're not even getting into the sound yet. We'll get into the sound after, but there's definitely some differences right away we can notice. The other thing we're going to notice here is in the sky when you have a solid blue color. Uh, you will see the angled lines that I mentioned in the Hyperkin review. And those angled lines are nowhere to be seen on the RetroTINK. So exactly where these angled lines are coming from, I don't know. <laughs> Is it just a cheap cable? Is it bleed in on the S-Video uh, signal? Or is it something happening in the, um, you know, the deinterlacing or the scaling um, side? Uh, but clearly it's there. We've seen these angled lines on the Hyperkin before and there are no angled lines on the RetroTINK. So honestly it looks better, it sounds better, and it has no lag. It's basically better in every perceivable... It's, it's basically better in every way. And, you know, that's, again, aside from the fact that you don't have a cable that can break and the, all of the electronics are, are useless. So, the RetroTINK is definitely the better way to go. Yes, it costs twice the price, but it's worth, it's worth it. 
Well, let's continue on listening to the sound before I forget, because I, I almost did. The sound on the Hyperkin is so quiet that in editing, I always have to crank up the volume to the point it's like clipping and sounds distorted. So here's the audio out of both without any of the volume adjusted. This is just straight how it came out of them. So here's the Hyperkin. And then now here's the retro tink. So as you can clearly hear, the retro tink is a lot louder. It's more where it should be it's closer to where it should be you don't have to crank the volume up on your stereo or on your tv or in your video editing software to get the volume where it should be clearly the sounds better no doubt about that so on to n64 and this is where this thing could shine for some people it could come in handy for some people uh n64 looks like garbage it really does it's really blurry and no matter what you do, you plug the N64 into a modern TV, it's just going to look really, really bad. Now here it only looks bad. It doesn't look really, really bad. <laughs> it looks actually pretty good, considering N64 hooked up to a modern TV without SCART RGB mods, without, you know, internal digital HDMI mods. This actually looks pretty good. Here it is with this, the um, the smoothing off. And now with the smoothing on. It definitely makes a noticeable difference and I think it looks good with the smoothing on. I think on the N64, this smoothing feature really helps. So if you have an N64 and you want a quick and easy way to hook it up to your TV with HDMI and not have it look like complete garbage, this thing does the job. All right, now on to testing it with the Sega Genesis and the Sony PlayStation using composite. I really wanted to test this, especially the Sega Genesis, um, because right on RetroTink's website, it states that the Sega Genesis and the Sony PlayStation output a slightly out of spec composite video signal that may not work with the RetroTink. So I was a little worried that this wasn't going to work with my Sega Genesis, but I hooked it up and it worked fine. Honestly, it looks pretty good. Considering that's composite, that's the best I've ever seen, you know, a Sega Genesis hooked up composite to my television. So it looks pretty good for composite. Uh, as with the PlayStation 1, um, I got out my original PS PlayStation 1, my original PlayStation, and <laughs> it was a gobbledygook mess. I thought maybe it was a bad cable, so I tried a different cable. I tried one of these generic scalers, still didn't work. Tried it hooked directly up to my TV, still didn't work. So I think this is a bad PlayStation. <laughs> so I got out my two PS1s, the little mini PS1s and um, they seem to work fine although neither one of them would read the game disc so I guess I, I think I just have three PlayStations that don't work <laughs> but I mean as far as the PS1 went both of them 
you saw the video in the you know the boot up and in the you know internal BIOS menu, so I, I think it works fine. It's a, I think it's safe to assume, like video wise, this is this is working fine. Um, I just can't actually get into a game because they won't read the disc. So again, I really only proven that I have three broken PlayStations here. So uh, I guess last but not least, we'll do a uh, an NES. We'll hook the NES up with this and we'll compare it with that cheap $20 scaler. So this is the NES um, through the RetroTank with composite uh, compared to one of these $20, less than $20 sort of n generic um, composite to uh, HDMI uh, converters. This one upscales to, to um, 1080p, but I don't think that really matters. But actually, you know, to give that cheap thing some credit, the cheap generic under $20 scaler, the video quality actually looks really good. I just don't know about lag. I, I assume there's definitely some lag. And again, with the RetroTINK, zero lag. So keep that in mind. Uh, here it's probably more about the lag and the difference in color than anything. Um, actual just sharpness or image quality itself actually looks pretty good on that cheap scaler. So. There you go. I guess that's it. That is the RetroTINK 2X Mini. Uh, it worked with everything that I threw at it. Um, it looked really good with the Super Nintendo. Looks pretty good with the N64. I gotta say that uh, smoothing feature on the N64 I think is actually worth it. And uh, it actually looks pretty decent on Sega Genesis considering that's composite. You know, Sega Genesis was never known to have the best composite video signal quality. And... Um, I think that actually looks pretty good considering. So, no weird artifacts, no vertical lines in the screen, none of that temporal sharpening weird jitteriness going on. Um, the color accuracy I think is better, and zero lag. So, this thing does what it's supposed to do, and it does it very well. And honestly, who's surprised? <laughs> You've all heard great things about the retro tank, I'm sure. Um, it just it turns out it's true. It's a great little device, definitely worth the money. See you guys later.